How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Figure 4 Daily. It's Tuesday, August 10th, 2010, here at figure4online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com. Joined today by Brody Lee of Chikara, Dragon Gate USA, a number of other promotions as well. And Brody, how are you doing today? I am doing very good. Uh, got done working for the day, got my pizza and a beer, so I'm training and ready to go. I don't want this to come off like a dating show or anything like that, but what's your height and weight? <laughs> I am legitimately six foot seven and two hundred and seventy five pounds. Okay. Now the reason I ask is because obviously like back in the eighties and even the nineties, everybody was big. Like big guys yeah. in this business. And you know, I've I've met some some of the older workers and even the guys that weren't like really muscular or really fat, you just meet them and they're just like big people. And they're very uh thing I've noticed is that they're they're very dynamic and they're 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 just they take up space and yeah. even today I've noticed uh, when I've done some WWE dark dates that um, when you go into that locker room those guys are even bigger than you would think they are most of them yeah I I oh go ahead go ahead I was gonna say I was surprised at how big Jeff Hardy is yeah you know uh, Jeff Hardy I remember when he first went to TNA this was uh, the first time he went like in two thousand five two thousand six. You know, they, they had a lot of small guys on the roster, and you never noticed it until he showed up, and he looked like Brody Lee and Chikara on that show, right. actually. He, he stands out, and he's, in WWE, he's just a normal man. Yeah. So, I mean, when I walked up into the backstage area, I was amazed at how big these people were. Yeah, somebody put up so. some pictures on Facebook. They'd gone to a, a WWE event, and they met a lot of the guys, and they had all these pictures of them standing next to these wrestlers, and... You know, I, I wasn't there, but but seeing these guys next to normal people, they're right. big people. Oh, still. Yeah, they're huge. And, that's, and and to think back that to the '80s and even and earlier than that, that these guys were even bigger and in and even like even better shape, if you could even say that, is is it's crazy. So the the point of the question was, I I've seen you working, and and you've worked in Chikara, obviously. And what is it like in 2010? Being like, you know, you're a really big guy now on the indie scene. I mean, there are a lot of small guys, and you're a giant out there. And what is that like? Um, to be perfectly honest, it's not a terrible thing to go into a locker room and to tower over people in professional wrestling. Um, I have to say that a lot of my success has been because of my size and learning how to work with my size as opposed to against it, which uh, if you ever look at that in my earlier stuff, I didn't want to be a big man. I wanted to do everything I could, but now I've learned to just use my size, make things bigger, make things hurt more, and and just dominate people. When did you first break in? Uh, I would say it was about 2001. My cousin was uh, doing some things in a ring, surprisingly, uh, just in my area, and he invited me down, and I was hooked. I was a big WCW fan at the time, so uh, <laughs> I was pretty hooked. Yeah, I actually was. I was on your MySpace, and first off, I was unaware that the the Brody and Brody Lee was short for Brodacious. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> it can be short for many things. Brodacious is one of them, um, and also just you know that I didn't get my name from Bruiser Brody per se. More of the movie Mallrats. And Jason Lee's name in that is Brody, to just calm all those internet rumors. It's actually funny because <laughs> when you hear Brody Lee and you you see you work, it's like, oh well, obviously it's you know big fan of Bruiser Brody. And right, you would have to think that the person like me with my name and my look would be an idiot to not name himself after Brody Lee or after Brody Bruiser Brody. But yeah. I didn't. <laughs> now the. Uh... The MySpace here, I was looking at it, and, of course, people can vote, post videos and that sort of thing, and, and I noticed that, like, your videos here is the Steiner Brothers Crash from 1998 with the NWO. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I just thought that was... It was so... I'll, be, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I haven't been to my MySpace in probably two years, so I don't know exactly what's going on there. Actually, someone else posted that. I'm sorry. Oh. August 14th, 2009. I just saw it, and I thought, what a random video. What a, a random classic moment that somebody found right there. I'm perfectly okay with that being posted. Now, you you uh, were a WCW fan, and, I mean, who were some of your influences? I mean, obviously, you know, you didn't take the name from Bruiser Brody, and probably a little young to have seen a lot of Bruiser Brody, but who were the guys <laughs> growing up that you just thought were so cool? 
I mean, obviously I've watched a lot of Bruiser Brody nowadays and I've gotten able to get a hold of tapes and, and his, his work other places. And um, so watching him now, he I've honestly become a fan of him. But, like, back then, Jake the Snake and Rick Rude, which are WWE guys, but, I mean, when I was a little bit older, I was really into the big show. And uh, in his first run in WCW when he was really just going out there and killing people and... I mean, it really didn't seem like he had a clue what he was doing, but it didn't matter because it really entertained me. And everything became such a train wreck by that point that I didn't miss TV shows on Monday and Thursday because I wanted to see what was going to happen. Now, you mentioned the big show, and he's obviously a, a big guy, but he works like a big guy. So when you right. first started training and you broke in, you mentioned that you didn't want to be a big guy. You wanted to do yeah. all of the stuff. And I was... <laughs> why was that? Um, I was a fan of, of Ring of Honor and um, Japanese wrestling also, and um, a fan of the WCW Cruiserweights, and <laughs> basically thought that due to me being semi-athletic and and for some reason being thought that I would not look goofy doing those things, which proved quite the contrary. Now, I, I've seen some of your, your more recent stuff, and, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, th- there was a shot of, of uh, Claudio press slamming you over the top to the floor, which first off, Claudio yeah. press slamming you is astounding. He's a, he's a freak. But uh, Claudio Castanelli is a remarkable man. He is the strongest man I've ever met. Um, he's the only man that I know that can enter a bodybuilding contest um, in a not peak condition um, and win it. Yeah. And the thing about it was that it's just his condition every day. Yeah. He he press slammed you over the top. This this remarkable man, and yes. you know it's a big bump for a big guy. And and I've seen yeah. a lot of other stuff. And and I guess you know when you when you see you working nowadays, you're you're still doing more stuff than your average big guy does. I mean, you're you're certainly no Sid or Kevin Nash or anything like that. But I guess <laughs> tell us a little bit about what you used to do that you've you've removed from your arsenal. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't hate to be Sid or Kevin Nash because they're both great but uh, <laughs> uh a lot of arm drags a lot of uh diving things off the ropes a lot of lucha things um dives outside of the ring uh i used to try moonsaults in practice and then not be able to walk for a week uh anything you can think of that a cruise rate would do uh, i've been told not to do anymore <laughs> <laughs> now now did you approach chikara or did chikara approach you is it something where you you saw all the lucha and high flying and thought god this would be fun or did well, they see you and think wow a big guy we could do something with um they actually they definitely didn't see me because at that time i was just doing a uh, a different gimmick which was me just having fun and doing my thing and being a cruise rate and uh i went to a show with the olsen twins and i think it was 2007 and we're sitting in the pre-show meeting, and Reckless Youth hadn't shown up yet. So they, um, the Olden Twins put me over to Quackbush, and during the meeting, he just said, uh, is Brody Lee here? And I said, yep. And he said, all right, you're in a match tonight. And from there on in, uh, I did two matches as my old gimmick, went away for six months, and then came back as uh, what I am now. Now you... So thank you, Reckless Youth. That's just how it often happens, actually. Some dude doesn't show up, and you brought your gear. Exactly. Now, I noticed when you tell that story, you, you mentioned the different gimmick several times without mentioning what it was. <laughs> I was trying to avoid that, but no. Um, I used to be the right stuff, Brody Lee, and I wore tassels, and I was pretty... Um, I guess I was entertaining. I'm not going to say I wasn't, but it wasn't what it should have been. Now, when you when you went in there as the right stuff, Brody Lee, with all of your tassels, you mentioned yes. having two matches, leaving, and then coming back with, I guess, the new Brody Lee. Was this right. something where, where Quackenbush afterwards sat you down and said, look, the tassels have got to go? Or was this well, your decision? At the time, um, it, it, it was kind of like a mutual thing, but um, Mitch Ryder actually had come to me and discussed this with me with Quackenbush's blessing. And um, through some email and phone discussions, we came up with the whole new thing and then just went with it full force for the next few months. So I literally have to thank Mitch Ryder for a lot. Now, you went undefeated for the first year. I was actually just – I was reading some of the the storylines here, and and, uh, 
you know, Mike Quackenbush always gets votes for best booker. And right. I... I don't mean this in a derogatory way at all. I I I like Mike Quackenbush. He's been on the show. This is not a knock, but when when I read the storyline of you and Claudio Castagnoli, it was really good. But my my first thought was like, I don't know if like Mike Quackenbush is an awesome booker or if he's just a really good booker and everyone else in this business just completely sucks because well. I don't know exactly. I think it's like it's like saying that uh, that Dana White booked Kale Sonnen and uh, Anderson Silva to do what they did. Sure. Like you can book exactly what you want to happen, but the guys still have to go out there and do it. And the way they do it is going to be their own touch. So you just take that story and make with what you can of it. And I, with Claudio, I, I've never had better chemistry with somebody, and literally that was an amazing year for me. Basically, what happened is is you were going around beating up a bunch of little dudes, right. and then Claudio comes along and he's also big, and he challenges <laughs> you to a match, and right. you, you have one match that ends in a DQ when one of you kicks the ref, then in the second match the other one kicks the ref, which builds right. to a no DQ match, which builds to Claudio getting fucked, and then you have a cage <laughs> match which the babyface wins. It's like this is Mr. Albert, it's, fa- it's fairly academic. I understand. What's the point? It's like this is perfect. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's perfect pro wrestling right. booking. And, and I just look at everyone else, and they're just all too stupid to do stuff this easy. And I think what it is is that less can so be more. Like, you don't need a thousand things involved in the storyline. It was me and Claude, it was Claudio saying, you know what, you're a big guy. I don't like what you're doing. I'm going to stop you. And it's me saying, no, you're not. And that was that was the angle. Yeah, and it, it was it, it just I didn't even I didn't even see all of it, but I I just read about it and I thought that's perfect. That is perfect right, it, it, pro wrestling it booking. Went all the way down to where we got DQ a bunch of times, couldn't keep it in control, uh, had some wild brawls, and then uh, it all came down and culminated in a cage match. So anyway, Mike Quackenbush may in fact be the best booker. Um, right, <laughs> but that's a, l- a large part of that. Again, no disrespect to Mike Quackenbush, but a large part of that is because nobody else actually knows how to book. So, and, and that's the thing I don't understand. Like when, when you talk about a TNA, when um, watching, I watched the show this Sunday, and I walked away pleased, um, just because I turned to my friend and said, "Wow, that actually built to the main event. It was different than any other TNA pay per view I've seen in a long time." Yeah. The fact that the end was the last two or three matches were bigger than anything that happened before it, and actually built to that, amazed me. Yeah, I I watched a lot of TNA pay per views and come out of it offended, and I was not offended at all by the show on <laughs> Sunday. So exactly, congratulations to them. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, how did the good start, uh, good start. how did your stint in ROH come about? Um, I actually had just finished up a show with Chikara. I was down in Philadelphia hanging out at Downey's on um, South Street, which is a popular hangout, and got a call from Gabe Sapolsky, um, asked me to come in, and at the time I was headed to England and Germany for three weeks. So he said, okay, as soon as you come back, give me a call. Um, gave him a call, that call when I came back, and I believe... I don't know if it was September 25th or something, I did the debut against, uh, where I did a run-in on Aries, and then I did a match with Delirious against Chicha Cloudy. And then from there, um, that night, it slowly got fired, and it went from there. Now, looking back at, uh, at your career, I guess how long has it been since you've, uh, you've been actively wrestling? Tuesday. 2000, uh, I would say 2001, 2002, I definitely started wrestling, wrestling. And then um, I would say that I, I was actually a wrestler from 2007 till now. It's kind of actually astounding that with, with your size and, and everything that it took like five years to, to have it really take off. Right. And um, the thing is, I never really understood the whole business aspect of it. I never understood... Uh, uh, I, I mean, I just didn't understand that I was presenting a product to people. And when I started to understand that more, uh, things started picking up. So I think the whole, uh, like the whole beginning of my career, I kind of just write off as uh, a really good learning experience, but kind of wish it would have went a lot different. In what way? Um, I wish I would have been trained <laughs> better and probably by more people and, um, possibly just gone to, uh, I tell people now when they come to train in Rochester, I say, 
uh, do you want to wrestle for a living? And when they say yes, I say go to Florida. Mm-hmm. Because you're not going to get that training up here. And no offense to anybody around here or anything like that, but I, I just don't think there's nothing reputable here. I said, I tell them to go to Land Storm School, stuff like that. If tell- you're going to do it, do it right. And I didn't do it right. Well, tell us a little bit about that experience. Um, I, I wasn't poorly trained. Um, I was trained by Rick Matrix here in Rochester. Um, and literally, it was six months of just um, falling down a lot and getting dropped by him a lot in different ways. And so, I mean, that really built up the, the thick skin I needed to be a wrestler. Um, from there, um, Dunn and Marcos of old ROH fame live in my area. And um, they would come down to the school. And they showed me so much more of, like, different styles and stuff like that. And then from there, um, Tony Mamaluke lived in Schenectady, which is about three hours from here. And about three three or four of us would go down there about uh, every two, three weeks for about four or five times. And he would just show us, like, these real cool shoot things and just the real inner workings of pro wrestling. Now, you've mentioned, uh, I guess you mentioned Florida there. Are you speaking specifically of the... Uh, the WWE, I don't even know actually if, if developmental has a, a school for those that are, are not under contract, but uh, who in particular are you talking about down there? Um, well, that's what I mean. Like, um, like if, if I see a kid come in who's six foot five and 250 and in shape, and I, I, I'd say don't come to this school because you're not, you're going to get used wrong or you're, you need somebody to see you. Sure. I tell them to send them right away to Florida, yeah. to WWE, because if they see that, <laughs> they'll bring you in first and teach you how to wrestle. Yeah. As opposed to learning up here and something possibly going wrong, some, or you not liking it, or this, all this stuff that could happen. So I just I try to get people to skip the step of, you know, going to your regional or local school, unless it's super reputable, like uh, Shikara, like the Ring of Honor school, like Lance Storms, or like WWE. How many WWE tryouts have you gotten? Um, I would term zero of them tryouts, but I have been there um, six times now, and I've worked out for them every time, um, and literally not gotten an ounce of feedback. Interesting. <laughs> that, that that surprises me actually, because usually yeah, it, tall guy, it, uh, immediate interest. Right, and um, <laughs> I don't know if. I honestly don't know what it is, but I don't know if they don't like me or what it is, but they call me still to come do darts or, like, do uh, extra work still, so I don't honestly know. Yeah, I'll be honest, I'm not even positive I want to work there full-time, yeah. and I know that you probably don't hear <laughs> independent wrestlers say that, but I don't know if I could. Yeah, he. Uh, I, I would guess that if they if they don't like you, they wouldn't keep calling you. So <laughs> probably a, a good. Uh, it's a good thing for now. Right, and that's the thing. Like I go eat some catering, whatever. It's all right. <laughs> now you talked about the um, starting ROH the weekend that Gabe was fired, and it was, uh, it was the exact day. <laughs> the exact day. Um, do you know what the plans were around that time and how things turned out? Um. Very, 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 very different. Yeah. Um, basically, the plan was uh, me to just go on a roll there and to kind of uh, be the be the bodyguard for um, Jimmy Jacobs and Delirious at the time and be their muscle and take care of people for them. Mm-hmm. Um, eventually leading to a showdown. Um, I believe Gabe said this in his guest booker piece where uh, – the showdown would be in New York City with me and Necro Butcher. And what ended up happening was I wrestled Necro Butcher the next week in Montreal. Hmm. <laughs> kind of a little bit rushed. Right. right. So, and, and I can't blame the, the current uh, regime that's there for anything. Um, I just didn't fit in at the time. So. What do you think of, of Necro shaving his head? I just saw him with his shaved head last night on ROH TV and thought he looked like... Ivan Koloff in 2010, and maybe even older. Uh, anything Necker wants to do, he can do. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to tell him different. Um, I prefer the wild, crazy look. Um, we've actually been tagging a lot up around this area, especially in Jersey, and uh, I definitely prefer him with the wild and crazy hair. Now, but I, he's I, another man I owe a ton to because he's taught me so much about the business inside and out. 
I, I'm a big fan of Necro. He's been on the show. He's a really nice guy. But I have to ask, oh. is it better teaming with him than, than facing him? My guess would be yes. Um, I prefer to always have Necro Butcher on my side of the ring. Yeah. Um, so, yes. <laughs> now, you're doing uh, some stuff with Evolve as well. You had the match with John Moxley. Uh, I know that uh, Gabe liked that match. What were your thoughts on it? Um, I actually loved it. Um, I didn't think that me and John Moxley really kind of fit into the mold of the um, almost MMA-type promotion, but I think we bring the the, um, the level of just fighting, of just coming out and fist fighting, and I think that's what we did. And the ending worked, and uh, they actually ended up suspending me out of the deal. So, But I actually liked it a lot. Uh, John Moxley is a great talent. Uh, he can talk his ass off, and I look forward to doing a lot more with him. Has Gabe given you any sort of advice in terms of, of working, in terms of, of interviews, your character, anything like that? Um, basically, just be big. Um, <laughs> anything Cruiserweight does, I don't do. So so basically, this is what you were talking about earlier, about uh, right. being told, no more of this. Yeah. But even, I mean, even like, and Claudia used to tell me that every time, and, and there's many people that have told me, you know, and Robert Strong and Ring of Honor, and all these people have told me, told me, and it, it's still, it's so much, you have to pay attention 100% of the time, because if I slouch a little bit, or or I pick somebody else different, like, it changes the whole dynamic of how people are looking at me. Yeah. Now, have they talked to you about doing these big, flashy moves like I guess the, the the analogy I would make is is if you remember that that Brock Lesnar Kurt Angle match, mm-hmm. and and granted he landed on his head, but right. Brock was going to whip out the Shooting Star Press in the main event of WrestleMania. It was like right. if he was going to do it one time, this was right. the that time was the, to do it. And and have they talked to you about tough. about this? Um. Well, I mean, there's. I don't know if that spot's going to come soon, but, I mean, if that spot was to come for me and it was that big of a stage or or that big of a deal and, and something needed to be bigger, I have, I mean, there's things I can do and I'm not opposed to doing, so you might do that in the near future. Because I remember they they always talking about Big Show or the Giant in WCW and how... With his moonsault. Yeah, the power plant, he would do moonsaults. And I don't believe it. I, I don't know if I believe it either, but, <laughs> but you know, it was like, you, you wouldn't want Big Show out there in every match doing a moonsault. But Correct. If, exactly. if the time came where he's, you know, facing whoever at, at the Big Show of the year and the big spot at the end of the match requires but, him, or not even requires, but but could work out well with him doing a moonsault, that's the time you do it once. Absolutely. And um, a, a kind of a thing for that is I was shooting with um, Incoherence and uh, Hollow Wicked and Chikara. And one of Hollow Wicked's moves is a step up for Kanana. Mm-hmm. So at the end of our thing, in the last match, I hit one, and literally the place came unglued because they've, they've probably never seen anything like it, and it just came at the perfect spot, out of nowhere, and I've maybe done it once or twice more in the past nine months. Yeah. So I, I guess that would be the one. Now, the last Dragon Gate show, you'd been beating up a lot of dudes, and then the cliffhanger, I guess, was your announcement that now you were coming after a Japanese man. And that is correct. Are, are you uh, are you aware of how this is going, or or does Gabe kind of just give you the storyline one step at a time, and and you do not <laughs> yet know who this Japanese man is going to be? Uh, in Dragon Gate, I really just show up and say when am I on, and I just go out there and do whatever I want to do, pretty much. Um, there's no set person in the sights right now. Um, I literally said it because I don't want the same thing to happen. Um, and just kind of get lost in the shuffle, I want to make the impact now as opposed to just let it go away. So, like, if if this was Ring of Honor in 2007, I don't want to let that chance go away again. So I'm going to make it happen. Have you had a chance to talk to Jim Cornette, and has he given you any advice? Mm, Cornette was not around by the time I was doing um, ROH TV, so I have not met him. I had met him way back when I was doing Ring of Honor Ring Crew, in like 2002, he was doing some shots with them, and I, all I could say is that he was very entertaining, ripping people on the phone with the Briscoe brothers in the back. <laughs> We've got a bunch of questions here for you. I want to get into uh, some of these so people don't get very upset. 
Uh, this person <laughs> wants your favorite quote from Mallrats as a big fan. Uh, wow. Um, I don't know. <sighs> There's so many good ones. I might just have to go with the fan one. The sandal. Actually, they put a bunch of quotes here on this thread, but unfortunately, I've not seen the film, so I don't. Uh, I don't understand half of them. But uh, I don't know the exact quote, but there's something about the guy being a Santa Claus, and I mean, I don't want people to think I'm obsessed with the movie, so I don't know the quote exact. This so isn't like the Big Lebowski or anything like that. <laughs> right. So I apologize. <laughs> this person wants to know. Actually, this this story I, I was going to ask you about. Uh, apparently, like. The Colin Delaney role in ECW could have gone to you, but <laughs> you were just too big to be um, Colin Delaney. Is that true? This is actually a really great story. Um, this is like my third time there, and this was the one I just done Buffalo the night before, and I was in Rochester, and um, I was actually there with my buddy Pepper Parks, and we were just hanging out all day, and then uh, Jamie Noble comes down to the ring and just looking around, and he just looks at us and he goes, you know any small guys around here? And I go, well, yeah, I do. And so I actually called up Jimmy Olsen first. He didn't answer. Oh. So then I, so then I called uh, Colin Olsen, and I said, how fast can you be to the uh, Blue Cross Arena? And he said, well, I'm working right now, but I can be there in 10 minutes. This is like the, right this right like right the Hulk Hogan corner. story with so the, said, uh, the wacky said, grill. Right down here. So me and Noble walked outside, and... Uh, Noble asked me why I didn't say anything to him earlier. And I said, well, you didn't ask. And then Colin came walking up with shooter boots around his uh, neck. And Noble goes, that's fucking perfect. And grabbed him and walked away. <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> and then um, the thing happened with Shelton. And me and Pepper are still back there. And we're, he walks. He, they walk into the back. And when he walks to the back, Johnny Ace has him by the arm. And it just walks him through everybody. And he's gone again. And he comes back out and he says, uh, they're flying me to Richmond next week. And the rest was history. Now, this person's question was actually, how much did it suck to lose that spot? But to me, it's almost well, like, <laughs> you know, once once you get that spot and they're done with you, it's real tough to be brought back. You know what I mean? Right. And and it's almost is, like you're lucky this, this wasn't you. Right. And, and I mean... I would love to be on WWE TV maybe once in my life or whatever, you know, to say that I did it. But if they want to, if they want to hire me, I don't want that part of it. Yeah. I want, <laughs> but um, no, I don't think it sucks at all. I, I was really happy that I was able to help somebody out, and then the fact that it turned out the way it did was incredible and something I'll never ever forget. This person says, who came up with the idea of the big rig trucker gimmick? He says it was a vast improvement over the right stuff. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, Miss Ryder. Yeah, there you go. This person wants to know, has there ever been a couple of fans or a fan who just pissed you off to the point where you wanted to punch them in the face? Uh, here's another good story. Um, one time in Binghamton, New York, I did a big brawl. With, it was a four-on-four, and we were in and out of the crowd, and people were drunk. $2 mixed drinks at this place. It was ridiculous. Um, so people were just dumping drinks on us and stuff. So match ends, and I'm yelling at people, and all of a sudden I see out of the corner of my eye this man walk in the back door, grab a chair from the fourth row, and just throw it in the ring. So I proceeded to jump the guardrail, chase him to the parking lot, fight him, come back inside, um, fight another fan on the way inside, and then be told to leave because the cops are coming. Jesus. So, yes, there's many instances like that. <laughs> you, you, are, you are the second coming of Bruiser Brody here. Well, I, I, honestly, it's like, I, I'm, I mean, it's, it's our ring, and, and we're taking care of each other in the ring. And for somebody to come in a door and throw a chair 20 feet straight up in the air when he's drunk out of his mind and not knowing what he's doing really just brought me to an, another level of anger. So... Yeah. Because it was my friends in the ring, and so, yeah. <laughs> this person wants you to discuss the greatness of wrestling former WWF jobber Lord Zoltan. Lord Zoltan is a great man. Um, if you want to look him up, his name is Ken Jennings. He actually was uh, a jobber in, like, the 80s for WWE, and he became a referee. And I asked him one time why he did that, and he said, well, the referees make more money. And I said, okay. So, but then he just stayed around the Pittsburgh area, and then he came up with this gimmick, Lord Zoltan, 
and he must have been 50 or 60 when we wrestled. And I gave him a pile driver, and I went to the back, and I'm standing around, and and the show had stopped. And I I thought I didn't know what happened, and I ran, you know, I didn't, I was freaking out. And the show stopped because he's still down in the ring, and I'm like, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. So they get him out of the ring, he comes to the back, and he <laughs> pops right up, looks right at me, and goes, I think we're gonna make some money now, kid. And I, <laughs> and I said, wow. And I sat down and talked to him for the next, like, three or four hours just about everything. Wow. And the fact that he could sell a move for 20 minutes in 2009 <laughs> really warmed me to him. That's awesome. This person says, inquire about commentating college hockey. <laughs> I feel like this is maybe my friend Mookie. Yes, anyway. it is, in but fact, I'm... Mookie. He's, he's, got, he's planted some questions here for you. Oh, that's fine. That's good. He actually gave me some, too, so it's good. Um, I actually did some work for the local um, Division One team, which is the Washington Institute of Technology. Um, I did a couple seasons just doing color commentary for them, and it was awesome. Is this something where, like, in the future – because, I mean, you always look at, like, Taz, and, and sometimes you'll hear people say, man – Poor Taz, he used to be the human, you know, wrecking machine. Now he's just a commentator. And I'm always thinking, good for Taz, you know? This Taz, guy's been making Taz money for something... years after he should have been right. axed. Right. Taz said something very telling on uh, the TNA broadcast this Sunday. He said, Joey Styles made people believe that I was a legitimate badass for however many years. Now, I think Taz knows that he's in a much better spot oh, yeah. <laughs> behind that desk doing what he's doing now, like you said. Yeah. Now, now and, has, has this ever been a, a thought that has crossed your mind of, you know, if, if for example, WWE offered me a job as a, say they heard my college hockey uh, commentary and offered me this job as an NXT broadcaster, would you <laughs> would you be open to that? Um, I don't know. I feel like they would ask me to shave, and I don't know if I'm down with that. The biggest but, announcer <laughs> of all time. If they did offer me that spot, I would take it in a heartbeat. You could do the the Frank Mir gimmick where you get in the ring and you tower over everybody you're interviewing. I love Frank Mir interviews. And he's, I love Frank Mir talking at all times also. He's a great man. He is something. And Mookie also wants you to tell the story of wrestling a TLC match in exchange for dinner. Which is actually bullshit because I didn't get dinner. But oh. we did this crazy we did this crazy TLC match and I actually had heat with the promoter because he wasn't paying us. So I was the only one in the whole promotion that said anything to him. So he was like, well, I'm buying you guys dinner. And so <laughs> I was so pissed off that I didn't go out that night with everybody. So he bought the other three guys dinner, and I never got my dinner. You need to go back and, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, have them make this right. Well, I, actually, I still work for the man. And uh, <laughs> at the last show, I did a cage match for him. And when we were at the bar, I actually made him give me a raise. So it's pretty neat. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so it all comes around. And he also wants you to talk about Dewey. I, I, I'd actually almost completely forgotten about Dewey. I guess he's one of the guys that got his head shaved on SmackDown as part of the SES. He is, and he is a character. Uh, <laughs> he's actually a really great kid, and the fact that um, – and people – you know how people – everybody around here just bears him because, you know, he's, he's a big fat guy who doesn't do it, but he knows how to work – what we were talking about, he knows how to work with his size and be entertaining with it. And the fact that WWE called him specifically to come to Ottawa to do the angle really was awesome. And I really just hope everything works out for this kid. He's a great kid. And he was actually supposed to go to Triple A, but I think they just canceled it on him. That sucks. Yeah. Well, I, I, I tend to believe that it doesn't suck for him because I didn't really want him going down there. I was actually going to ask, are you are you open <laughs> to the idea of uh, traveling to Mexico if the opportunity should arise? Um, Mexico is like the one place in probably the entire world that I'm not super interested in going. Um, if they offer me a weekend shot or a week shot or something like that, I would, I would go down and do it in a heartbeat, but I don't really have desire to spend time there. Uh, I've been told horror stories by other people. Yeah, and just things I, I don't know. I'm just not real super keen on it. You haven't worked Japan yet, have you? No, I have not. That is my really kind of my next goal. A lot of these things surprise um, me because it's like you know, Japan historically and and Mexico. You know, if you're a big white guy that can can work the style, you're you're in. 
Right, and I think if I even had uh, a second in WWE, I would be I would have no problems. Yeah, but I think that, and I think maybe as my name gets out there more and more, maybe it'll become okay. But I, as of now, I'm nothing. Person wants to know who on the Dragon Gate roster would you most like to run over, and he says to let you know that you versus Susumu is his all-time dream match of the week. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I would love to run over. I don't know if I would run him over, but I would love to try to run over Shingo um, and Dragon Kid and Stalker Ichikawa. <laughs> Actually, Dragon Kid, it's very likely you could run him over, to be honest. Uh, yeah, and he, he I don't know if I would catch him, but if I did get my hands on him, it would be an issue. That's right. <laughs> Got a question here. How are things with your new best mate, Frank Talent? Oh, my Lord. At this freaking Dragon Gate show last weekend, I did a run-in. This is all in the pre-show. did a run-in, and on my way out, must have hit the timekeeper's table. Well, I turned back around the aisle, and I don't know if you know Frank Town is the, the director of the commission, of Pennsylvania Athletic Commission. Um, he's standing, he's an old, he must be 70, standing toe-to-toe with me. And I'm looking down, I'm like, what? And he's screaming at me. You don't touch that fucking table. I don't know what the fuck you're about. This and, that. and I'm like, whoa. So I start screaming back at him. <laughs> so we get to the back, and he grabs Gabe, and he's like, you tell this SOB to get out of my building. He's not allowed back in here. You don't bring him back in here. He's done. And wow. So, <laughs> yeah. so Gabe goes, go outside, because I was about to yell back at him. Gabe goes, no, 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 go outside and just stay there. So I go outside, and I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Um Gabe comes against me, and he goes, listen, just tell him yes to everything he says. And I go, Gabe, I'll go apologize to him right now. So I walk up to Frank Town, and I say, Mr. Town, let me apologize. And before I can get that out, he goes, Brody, I am so sorry. I don't know what got into me. I am so sorry. And he just apologizes for the next 10 minutes. And then we walk through the locker room, and he threatens people, saying that I'm going to get him because we're best friends now. Wow. So, <laughs> welcome to Philadelphia. How about yeah. that? Frank he's Talent. A, Frank Talent is, a, is a, a crazy, crazy, crazy man. I, I had not heard that story. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was pretty interesting. Well, now you got it in there. Right. Now, you just bumped the table? What, what set him off in the first place? He, uh, he claims that I almost hurt the doctor. And the doctor came up to me and was like, no, you didn't even touch me. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I think he just lost his mind. But huh. he even said to me, he goes, I don't know what I was thinking. When I was looking up at you, I was scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> and this, is, this is all, I mean, like, he's now my best friend. Yeah. Like, yeah. literally, I, he's threatening, thre- like, hey, hey, you, you working, you working with him tonight? You better be careful, because he's my friend. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, and I just stand there and smile. <laughs> this person wants your thoughts on the greatness that is Roadblock. Roadblock, who is from Rochester, New York, which is where I'm from, um, I only did one angle with him at some random indie show way when I was a kid. I was 22. This is a long time ago. And uh, did an angle where he rolled in the ring after we beat somebody up. He picked the guy up, and he hit the move on him. He rolled out of the ring and rolled, walked out the front door, and I never saw him again. So That's that was sad. that time with the Rochester Roadblock. We got more questions here from Mookie before we wrap it up here. Okay. This person wants to know, uh, well, Mookie, he says, tell us your <laughs> thoughts when you, he should just be here helping do this interview. Thoughts when you first saw a sneak preview of See No Evil. I loved See No Evil. The fact that it consisted of a person getting killed with a, a cell phone being jammed down their throat and also involved Kane masturbating in a cage, five stars. You know what's funny is, See No Evil, I think, is still the oh, best-grossing WWE film they've ever done. Easily. And the fact that they haven't made another full horror film after that is beyond me, because it's the easiest genre to, to do B-films in. And these are some B-films they're doing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this person says, uh, Mookie again, longest match you've ever had and the best match you ever had, plus the first match you were ever paid for. Um, longest match was probably me, Steve Carino, um, which was probably like 2006, and that was just him wanting to go. 
and we did, and it was like 33, 34 minutes, and didn't feel like it, but it was. Um, my best match, probably something with Claudio Castagnoli. We've had a whole bunch of really good ones, and I've really, as, as each one got better, I, I would probably say the cage match in 2009 was my favorite, favorite. So, And the first match I got paid for, whew, I can't remember. Uh, there's a difference between getting paid for something and making a profit. I was going to say, I don't, know, 80s, I don't you know. know when that turned. 25 bucks, one of those right. type of deals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the but, final one here, I got to ask about this because I'm actually jealous. He says, mm-hmm. uh, talk about getting a chance to work out with William Regal. Oh, that was, um, and one of my, it wasn't, it was it, it sounds a lot better than it actually is, but, uh, and one of my WB extra things, we were all around the ring and he was just sitting there and I just went up to him and I said, Hey, um, I'm wondering if you could show me. And I really just wanted to know how to properly put on a top double wrist lock. And I knew he knew <laughs> probably a hundred of them. So I just asked him if he could properly show me that. And that turned into an hour and a half of him showing us things. Really? In the ring. Yeah, and just, you know, this is how you sell this, this is how you do this. You know, if you don't understand how to sell this, go home and twist it, and you'll see how to sell it. But just all these little things, and the fact that he's not training people somewhere is very upsetting to me. But I, like, I love that advice. If you don't know what it feels like, go home and twist it, and then you'll know. If you feel a wrist lock and, and you... Don't twist your wrist. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It's a hold. I, I've said this many times. When I see guys training, because my, my friend, uh, Buddy Wayne, has a wrestling school around here, and I go there and I, I watch the guys training, and, you know, you see these guys that, you know, they get kicked in the stomach, and they sell the exact same way they sell getting hit in the face. And part of me, right, right. I, I always just think, you know, I'd love to kick you in the stomach and punch you in the face just once so you'd exactly. know that you sell these in two completely different ways. I've actually been to a, I think it was a, I to think who it was, a Steamboat Pritchard seminar back in, like, way, a few years, five years ago or so, where Steamboat literally would hit somebody with something. If they didn't sell it right, he would just knee him in the gut. <laughs> and then be like, okay, there you go. Or slap him in the face. Yeah. And and he would say, I don't know how many of you guys have been in a fight, but think about you walking away from the fight, or think think about like you going to the hospital with an injury, you know, stuff like that. Like, there's different ways of portraying pain in different ways. Or not even pain. I mean, the other one that the buddy used to always mention was, right. you know, you take the guy to the corner and and the referee gives you the five count and you break it up. He would always freak out, and he would say, when the ref breaks it up, the guy in the corner should always put his fists up. Because oh my God. If, if you I, were in a I, fight, I, why would you not do that? If I, Especially if I'm, if I'm the bad guy, and I come in, I back that guy in, and his hands are down, I might just punch him in the mouth. Cause yeah. Why wouldn't I? Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's my issue with a lot of the training is I get so frustrated watching people train or, or watching people get trained. Um, I'm sure it's different with Buddy Wayne, but, like, Around here where there's seven schools and three legitimate professional wrestlers in the area, it just becomes a, a terrible thing for pro wrestling, and it's very frustrating. And then it becomes a thing where, well, do I tell them I don't want to work for them because I don't like what they're doing, or do I say no to that money? And it becomes a whole thing where if people aren't united, nothing's going to change, Yeah, which is almost impossible. Now, you've got Dragon Gate shows coming up through the end of the year and some yep, car have. shows as well. So go ahead and uh, get the word out. September 25th and 26th, I'll be in Chicago and Milwaukee for um, Dragon Gate USA. Before that, um, the weekend of September 10th, 11th, and 12th, I'll be in Germany for WXW. Um, and I have Chikara August 28th, um, September 18th in Baltimore. And then October 23rd. So that's pretty much the stuff I have going on right now. No shortage of of fun stuff coming up. Yeah, I mean, um, it's actually really funny. In August, I'm traveling 100 miles for six shows. And in September, I'm traveling 6,000 miles for eight shows. Wow. (laughs) That's pretty great that you get a chance to go to Germany and stuff like that, though. That's pretty cool. Yeah. 
this will be my fourth time over to Germany, and I've been. I went to France last year with PCO, and uh, went to England before that. And I literally, the wrestling has given me so much more than I ever imagined it would. Like to think that four years ago, somebody would be interviewing me, asking me about me, is mind blowing. So. Well, it was a hell of an interview. I wanted. I want to say that you did a, an excellent job here, and hopefully, at some point down the road, we'll get you on again. Obviously, tons of stuff to talk about. Most of it was from Mookie today, but uh, I think as you as you do more of the the Dragon Gate shows and and stuff like that, people start coming up with some real good stuff. So, I want to thank you very much for doing it. Fine job today. Thank you very much. Enjoy your site. Enjoy everything I enjoy, Melton. I need Buddy Wayne back. We'll get and Buddy Wade back. I know I there's people are trying to get a scandal started here on the board, but uh, we'll get him back. And actually, if you've if you've heard about Brent, he did just email me saying that we need to schedule him for the show. He was delighted by uh, last week's program, spending an hour talking about his hijinks at the wedding. So he will be back soon, everybody, for those concerned. So the one thing is, I I would love to come out there sometime if I if I'm anywhere near there and come out and train with Buddy at some point, and or just. Literally, go get a beer with Buddy. Yeah, well, if you're ever if you're ever coming out here, I know there's absolutely n- well, I shouldn't say absolutely no wrestling because you know, Kane <laughs> would get upset. But you know, there's very little wrestling out here. But if you ever do come out here, we'll we'll make sure to set that up. And if somebody steals the money, I'll I'll stop them. That's right. All right, so thanks again, and thanks, everybody, for listening. We're going to talk to you later on tonight. Brand new Brian and Vinny show and uh, a lot of other stuff coming up as well. So check it out, and we'll talk to you again after a while. If you're a big fan of these video clips here on YouTube, you're missing out on full-length shows. Down there on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, click that Join button, and when you sign up, you'll have full access to all of the shows that we've got up on YouTube, over 300 at current count. Wrestling Observer Live, The Brian and Vinny Show, and Figure Four Daily with Filthy Tom Lawler and Lance Storm. Hit the join button, sign up today. You can also click subscribe, and you'll always be alerted as to when new shows and clips are available.